the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> back you are in the lab room i'm your host lou thank you for joining me again on this wonderful friday afternoon as we continue our march to the regular season and through these two a days and it is almost coming to an end finally we have reached our last division the afc west and before i get to the afc west I want to comment a little bit on some of the action from last night. Uh, again, <laughs> the Cardinals played another football game in the preseason, their third preseason game, the all-important third preseason game. And their quarterbacks looked a mess again. Now, this offensive line, uh, with the loss of Levi Brown, is going to be a problem for them moving forward. Uh, that left tackle position is... Without a doubt, uh, the biggest question mark after the quarterback position on that team now. And their line wasn't good before Levi Brown got hurt. And now the absence of Levi Brown is, is looming even larger over this, this franchise because in Levi Brown's absence, and they plugged in a young left tackle, DJ Young, and he looked awful. And... His biggest problem is that he's stiff and his, his lateral movement is not what you would like to see out of your left tackle. He couldn't bend at the hips. Um, they played the Titans and he made Cameron Wembley look like an all-pro defensive end. I mean, Wembley was constantly in the backfield, uh, sacking the quarterback, disrupting plays. If they can't have this if they're going to put someone back there and expect them to uh, take hold of this uh, team and be the quarterback that they need them to be, they have to do something along that offensive line to shore it up. I don't know if they're going to have to play one of these young guys that they drafted or what, but they're going to have to do something. I think what they're going to do is kick over their right tackle um, and, and kick him over the left tackle, and they're going to have to plug in one of these young guys. And that's essentially what they're going to have to do is just plug leaks right now and and make a patchwork line to try to figure out who this quarterback is going to be because they have to protect. Like I said, you can't get and expect success out of your quarterback position if you can't protect them. It doesn't matter who your quarterback is. Pressure is not... Uh, any kind of friend, any kind of kin to a quarterback. And so they have to find a way to protect whoever is back there at quarterback because the quarterbacks aren't good already as it is. And so putting that much more pressure on them to perform, it, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't bode well for the Arizona Cardinals. So they looked like a team in disarray. Being that this was the third preseason game, I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to have to figure out who their quarterback is going to be. No one stepped up and, and took um, a firm grasp of the quarterback position in that third game. Both played. Both looked equally as bad. And so I, I believe they're going to go with Cobb. I think they should go with Skelton, but you, we'll see. We will see. Ken Wizard has a heck of a decision on his hands. You flip that over and you look at uh, Jake Locker and the Titans. Eh, I'm not really sold on Jake Locker as a starter. I told you uh, when we talked about the Tennessee Titans that I didn't think he was ready to start yet. And he hasn't changed my mind about that. He's still inaccurate. You know, it, there's times when he looks like he can be a threat out there at the quarterback position. And then there are other times where he looks erratic and 
until he can find a way to to find that happy medium and that balance that it takes to be a, a solid quarterback in this league, I think he's going to struggle. And so he's going to have his growing pains. They're going to have to just ride it out. They decided to go with him, and they just need to stick him in there and let him play, make mistakes, win ball games, whatever the case may be, leave him in, let him do what it is he's going to do so he can learn from it moving forward. Uh, also, the Packers and the Bengals play. The Bengals showed me, and again, it's preseason. It was the third game, but again, it's the preseason. But they showed me what I thought and what I suspect, which is when they play upper echelon talent, they're not able to rise to the occasion. I don't think they're ready to take that next step yet um, in the AFC uh, North. And so it's going to be a while for them. They're, they're going to have to continue to grow, though. But, you know, Andy Dalton didn't throw any touchdown passes. He wasn't particularly sharp. You could see the frustration on his face. A couple of times they got into the red zone but couldn't punch it in. And so these are things that they have to work on if they want to take that next step to being a, a team that can compete in the AFC North. You look at the Packers, their offense isn't where it needs to be at this point in the preseason. Aaron Rodgers looked good, but they, they didn't connect. They, they haven't been connecting uh, all preseason long. And uh, I, I don't have any doubts that they'll get it together. You know, Jennings coming off of an injury, uh, Rodgers, they still have never really picked up where they left off at from last year in the regular season. You remember the postseason, their first game, they were rusty. They didn't play that last game in the regular season against the Lions, and it showed in the playoffs. And they still look to be um, trying to get their stride back. And uh, once they get it, they'll be fine. But man, it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes them before they start you know, consistently scoring four and five touchdowns a game and, and making it look easy if they can get back to that level that they played at throughout the course of the 2011 season. Um, again, you know, plenty of games going on over the next couple of days. Tonight there will be a, a rash of games. Saturday, of course, the Redskins will take on uh, the Colts. They've hyped it up as the Robert Griffin III versus Andrew Luck game. Again, see past all the hype and look at the third preseason game for what it's worth and make sure that you're focusing in on the things that you need to be focusing in on. A lot of teams out there, Buffalo playing the Steelers. Um, again, tonight it's going to be a big one. Uh, the Seahawks and the Chiefs are playing. You're going to find out if, in fact, Russell Wilson can step up and give Pete Carroll and that Seattle Seahawks brass something to think about at the quarterback position. And there's a lot of games to be played, and uh, we're going to see who steps up, who steps back. And remember, after this, this slew of uh, preseason games, the first round of cuts are coming. So here's a guy's case for trying to stay on the team. They have to make their case to try to stay on these rosters. And so even if you know you're not going to make it, you need to be putting good film on display for other teams to uh, look at, to, to possibly uh, pick you up and give you a shot there. So um, a lot of preseason action coming up, and it's a lot of meaningful, the last of the meaningful preseason games uh, for a lot of these teams. Now, the players, uh, every game counts. Every play counts. But... Uh, for the teams as a whole, this is it as far as meaningful preseason football. So enjoy. All right, so we move into the AFC West, and finally we have reached our last division. And the AFC West, <laughs> to me, is is a funny division. I get a kick out of the AFC West. They are uh, like a comedy of errors. And the AFC West is like the division in the NFL, I equate them to the house on the block that everybody, you know, everybody has their lawn groomed and trimmed neatly and nice. And the presentation in front of their house is, is gorgeous. And, and it's displayed like this throughout the whole block, except for that one house who really doesn't give a crap about their yard, 
their house isn't kept up as neat as the rest of the houses. And it's a sore eye on the block. That's the AFC West. They're the, they're the house that everyone has up Christmas lights and they don't bother to put anything up. That's the AFC West in the NFL. They're the black eye of, of the NFL. They're the division that, it, for all intents and purposes, 8-8, eight 9-7 and eight, and seven every year basically gets you a shot to win the division. You can say the NFC West, and really the both West aren't the best, but at least the 49ers have stepped up and made that division a, a viable division. There's no team in the AFC West that has done so. And so this division is just that that division that sticks out like a sore thumb. And you're like, why don't you guys just get it together? Everybody else is doing it. Why aren't you doing it? And so we start um, this division with the Denver Broncos, the divisional champs from a year ago. And this is a totally different team. The, the feel around the, the organization, the aura that uh, that Peyton Manning has brought to this organization it is a lot different. A year ago, the Denver Broncos uh, was a team that uh, just made it to the playoffs, barely. They limped into the playoffs, but were happy to be there. And once they got their ticket to the dance, they were able to make something happen with it. And that's why I always say just get to the show and you'll worry about it. And, and you can show what you can do once you get there, but you have to get in first and foremost. And that's what the Broncos did. And, and this Broncos team last year was predicated on running the football. Of, of course, with Tim Tebow as your quarterback, your passing game is not going to be uh, a world beater. You're not going to scare anybody uh, with your ability to throw the football. But what Tim Tebow does bring to the table and what was a strength for the Denver Broncos in the 2011 season and what was thought to be a strength moving forward in the 2012 season was their ability to rush the football. And Tim Tebow and Willis McGahee spearheaded an attack last year that gained over 2,600 yards um, total for the season. And per game, they averaged over 164 yards a game. So this was a potent rushing attack that was hard to stop. They were like a well-oiled machine that just steamrolled opposing defenses. And look, you, you had people like the Jets and Darrell Reeves speaking out about, oh, this defense, this offense is so vanilla and it's terrible. And you had Troy Palomalu coming out and saying, hey, they did the same thing. And I, and I didn't think it was possible to just continue to do the same thing over and over again and have it work. But it did. And that was the Denver Broncos offense. You knew you were going to get a heavy dose of the run. I've said this time and time again, and I'll continue to say it. Getting ran on is the worst thing that can happen to you in pro football. It's like getting, it's like getting told you're going to be punched in the face and getting your lunch money taken from you, you not believing it, and then the next day when you show up for school, getting punched in the face and getting your lunch money taken from you. That's what it feels like to get the ball continuously ran down your throat, knowing that that's what's coming and not being able to stop it. And that's what the Denver Broncos did. The defense played sound football, gave the team a chance, and in the fourth quarter, in the latter stages of the game, the running game usually proved to be too strong for the other de team's defense, and the Broncos would prevail. And that was a common theme for them in the 2011 season. But that was a strength. With Tim Tebow being shipped out to the Jets and Peyton Manning coming in, that that's no longer going to be a strength for the Denver Broncos. Now it's going to be that passing attack headed by Peyton Manning. If Peyton Manning is healthy, the passing attack is going to be the strength of the Denver Broncos. And he has some young weapons out on the football field to help him get it done. You look at Demarius Thomas and Eric Decker. These are two young, hungry, athletic receivers who can catch the football and make plays down the field. I think they can be poised for breakout seasons. They can both stay healthy. And if Peyton Manning is physically uh, the same Peyton Manning, that we saw throughout his uh, illustrious 
Indianapolis uh, Colts tenure. You also look at the tight end position. Peyton loves to work with his tight ends. He has a familiar one in Jacob Tammy. They also went out and got him Joel Dreesen from the Houston Texans. And so you think, you look at this offense, they've got weapons. They've got people for Peyton Manning to spread the ball around to. And all it is now is a matter of protecting him, keeping him upright, keeping that pocket clean, and allowing Peyton Manning to go to work. So you, you flip side that and go to the weakness. And it, the weakness last year was the passing game. Tim Tebow and his ability to, or lack thereof, to pass the football was definitely a, a weakness of this Denver Broncos team. It was a joke last year, uh, their passing game was. And so with Peyton Manning coming in, that will be shored up quickly. That's no longer a weakness for this team. And now what has to be in question is the running game. Peyton Manning has never been a quarterback that has been on a run-heavy uh team before because of his prowess as a quarterback and his ability to throw the football. But the running game is not going to fall off the face of the earth. But what is in what has never really been in question in Denver is the defensive tackle position because it's been bad. They haven't expected it to be good. It's been bad annually. And this is one of the reasons why the Denver Broncos rush defense has never really been what it needed to be to help this team be successful. If you are a Denver Broncos fan, that change back to a 4-3 defense from a 3-4 was a welcome sight. You had to be tired of seeing teams gas you up the middle in the run game because you didn't have a stout defensive tackle at the point of attack to hold up blocks, take on double teams, and stop teams from just running the football up the middle of the field. And so this change back to the 4-3 defense last year that John Fox brought was a welcome sight. And now the defensive tackle position needs to be addressed. The Broncos did so through the draft with their first selection in the second round, which was their first pick overall in the 2012 draft. And it was the defensive tackle out of Cincinnati, Derek Wolf. And they're probably going to move him out to defensive end, but that just shows you how much of a need their defensive tackle position has been that their first pick in the draft would be to address the defensive tackle position. They, they've got guys there in place that they're looking to plug in this year. They went out and got Justin Bannon um, in free agency. They've got Ty Warren, who they signed last year, but he got hurt and never played a snap for them. He's coming back. He's finally healthy. Those two guys in the middle should be a welcome addition to this Denver Broncos defense because their defensive tackle position has been a nuisance um, for the last three, four years strong. And so they have to shore up that defensive tackle position in order to, to shore up this defense and make teams more one-dimensional so that guys like Elvis Doomersville, and um, Von Miller can get after the quarterback. And so these two defensive tackles, Bannon and Warren, and, and the defensive rotation that they will uh, use this year, they're going to look to beef up uh, a run defense that was 22nd in 2011. And they need to improve on that uh, tremendously because, again, if teams can run the football, that opens up so many avenues to that that offense it affords them so many opportunities and the Broncos need to make teams more one-dimensional so you move on to camp battles and for the Denver Broncos no Sean Marino has been an enigma someone that's probably uh, been the source of a lot of disappointment to Broncos fans you spent a early round draft picked on on him in 2009 and he really has not paid dividends on that draft pick, He's, his career has been marred by injuries. Even his rookie season, which was probably his one of his most successful campaigns, was marred by injury as well. And so you really haven't been able to get that steady production out of no Sean Marino that you thought you were going to get when you drafted him out of Georgia in 2009. And so he's really skating on thin ice at this point. Last year, when he went out, and missed a good portion of the season. 
Now Lance Ball stepped up in his absence and took a lot of carries. Him and Willis McGahee helped that Russian attack along with Tim Tebow. And no Sean Marino was a forgotten man coming into the 2012 season. They drafted Ronnie Hillman, running back out of San Diego State. They still have Lance Ball. They still have Willis McGahee. And so you ask yourself, where is no Sean Marino's carries going to come from? Now, they like Lance Ball, but they don't love Lance Ball. And so no Sean is going to get his carries. But he's going to have to do something with them when he gets them. He's going to have to stay healthy. He's in a battle right now to be a Denver Bronco in 2013. If he doesn't have a big campaign this year, he's not going to be back in Denver after this season. They're going to cut ties with him. And so no Sean Moreno is in a battle not only for carries and playing time, but a battle to stay on the Denver Broncos roster next year and moving forward. And then you continue on, and we go to Rookie Watch. And so the Denver Broncos didn't have a first-round selection. And their first pick in the draft was a second-round selection, and we talked about Derek Wolf, the defensive tackle out of Cincinnati. Again, he's probably going to be moved to defensive end. He's a high-motor guy, someone that's going to be stout in his approach at the point of attack. He's going to help them in the run game, which they need desperately. And he's going to be a rotational defensive end. He's not going to be someone that's going to come in and start right away. They feel like they can move him around. He can play some defensive tackle on certain um, packages, and he can play some defensive end. And so they're going to move him around a little bit. He's going to provide depth at both of those positions. Also in the second round, the Broncos selected, and they're hoping that this is their quarterback of the future, uh, Brock Osweiler out of Arizona State. And this is a quarterback that is off the charts in terms of his measurables. I've never seen a 6'7 quarterback before. He's humongous. And his arm matches his height. His arm is just as big as his height is. And so he can throw the ball to every level of the football field. He can hit both hash marks with no problem. He can throw the deep ball. He can hit the inter intermediate stuff. His problem is just he's a young guy that hasn't had a lot of experience at the quarterback position. And so there's a lot of grooming. There's a lot of learning for Brock Osweiler to do. But if he's anything that he showed in college and, and the ability that he's ha he has, if he, he can tap into that potential and allow that to come to fruition over time, this guy could be devastatingly good in the NFL. And so the Broncos have identified him as the quarterback of the future. They want him to learn behind Peyton Manning. And what a great guy to be behind learning from. He could be someone that in three, four, maybe five years down the road could be like an Aaron Rodgers who sits behind the legend and comes in when his opportunity is given to him and takes off running when he hits the ground. Let's see. You look at their third round selection, Ronnie Hillman, the running back out of San Diego State. Again, another guy that they brought in. He's got some speed. He's not the most, uh, he doesn't have the most wiggle in the world. He's not going to make a lot of guys miss. But when he's out in space and, and is able to use his speed, he can be a dangerous uh, running back. And so that's an asset that the Broncos look to utilize in the 2012 season, and again, another guy that's looking to come in and take carries away from no Sean Marino. You look at their fourth-round selection, Omar Bolden, a cornerback out of Arizona State. And here's a guy who missed a good portion of the 2011 season uh, with an injury to his ACL. And so he missed all of 2011, but in 2010, he was, he was starting to form and shape into one of the better corners in the Pac-10 and in the nation. And so he has all the requisite skills to be a good corner in the National Football League. He can run. He's got good skills, good technique. Uh, his biggest thing, he loves to jam at the line of scrimmage. He's a big physical corner. He led the, the draft picks at the corner position in the, the amount of reps he did at the combine. So he's a big, strong, physical corner, loves to play press man coverage, and he's really good at it. 
He gets his hands on receivers, redirects routes. And so he's someone that the Broncos can see coming in and helping uh, that defensive secondary. And he's got a great uh, mentor to learn from in Champ Bailey, who's also good at press technique, but is definitely one of the better corners at getting back into his coverage and moving his feet and using good technique to uh, to make plays on the ball and using his athleticism uh, to be one of the better defensive backs in the league. So uh, Omar Bolden is going to come in, have someone to learn uh, under, and could be uh, the passing of the torch, so to speak, uh, from Champ Bailey to Omar Bolden if he is the guy that they think he can be coming off of that ACL injury. Also in the fourth round, the Broncos selected uh, the center out of Baylor, Phillip Blake. And here's a guy that, again, in a pinch, can come in and play center for you. He's an athletic center. Of course, in that Baylor offense, he had to be an uh, athletic guy to, to be able to open up holes for that running game, to be able to protect uh, Robert Griffin III and all his athleticism. And so Blake is a good addition to this Broncos team, uh, not looking to come in and start right away. Looking for him to come in, learn the position and all the nuances uh, that it entails. And down the, down the line, maybe he could be someone that could step in and start for the Broncos at that center position. Their fifth round selection was defensive tackle um, Malik Jackson from Tennessee. And again, this is the Broncos trying to address this defensive line and primarily this defensive tackle position. Again, the, they are not drafting Road graders, they're not drafting space eaters. Malik Jackson was an undersized defensive tackle at Tennessee. And so his big thing was being able to get pressure and get into backfields by using his athleticism and his being undersized and quicker than most offensive linemen. And so that's what the Broncos are going to look to utilize from Malik Jackson, his ability to knife through defenses, use his speed to get in front of the face of the offensive lineman and create uh, havoc in the backfield and try to get to the quarterback. So he's going to be someone that's going to be in the rotation, looking to try to help get pressure on opposing quarterbacks, looking to try to create havoc in the run game. He's not someone that's going to take on double teams. That's not his forte. He's not a big uh, space eating, uh, strong point of attack, defensive tackle. He's a quick, shifty, um, knifing and swim move type of defensive tackle who's going to look to try to get in the backfield and disrupt plays before they get started. Look at their sixth-round selection, and that's Danny Trevethian, the linebacker out of Kentucky. A guy, he's a tackling machine. He's not going to wow you with his measurables. He's not going to wow you with his athleticism. What he's going to do is he's going to be where he's supposed to be when he's supposed to be there and make the play when he gets there. He's, he's a tackling machine, a guy that's put up high volume number of tackles at Kentucky. He's played multiple positions, but he's at home at linebacker, and that's where the Denver Broncos are going to use him. He's going to be a core special teamer, and, and who knows, if he develops as a linebacker, maybe he might see the field. And so that takes us to the experiment. And I kept it simple with the Broncos. I, I titled their experiment Orange Crush. And look, Peyton Manning is going to take this offense to new heights, if healthy. And so that's not something that they need to worry about, the offensive side of the football. The defense, however, needs to step up, and they played pretty good football. Don't let the numbers skew you last year. The defense it wasn't ranked that high in many categories. But this defense was skewed by a lot of blowout losses. They got destroyed by the Detroit Lions at home. The Packers put a drubbing on them. There were several games last year where the Bills just annihilated the, the Broncos last year. And so there were several games where they just didn't look like an NFL football team. And a lot of that had to do with Tim Tebow struggling uh, on the offensive side of the football and turnovers being uh, made by the uh, Broncos. But... Those numbers skewed the, the Broncos defensively. This was a good football team on the defensive side of the ball. But if they want to take it to the next level, they have to border being great. And so Peyton Manning is going to come in, and again, he's going to make this offense 
look like night and day from a year ago. But the defense has to step it up and, and turn it up because the defense is in the AFC, uh, especially when you get to the top of uh, top-notch quality. And in order to compete with them, you're going to have to play some sound defensive football. So we go into the research question. Is Peyton Manning the same player that led the Indianapolis Colts to two Super Bowl games? And if so, can he lead this hungry, new-look Denver Broncos squad to back-to-back -back AFC West crowns and possibly beyond? Look, Peyton Manning, if he can come in and show us that he is the Peyton Manning of old, not necessarily the same Peyton that was a MVP through for 49 touchdowns in the league. We're not talking about that guy. We can just see the Peyton Manning that was the steady general of the Indianapolis Colts who got guys in the right position, who, who took advantage of mismatches out on the defensive uh, side uh, when uh, playing against opposing teams. If we can get the Peyton Manning that shredded defenses and, and read and looked through uh, defensive fronts like he had on X-ray vision, then the Denver Broncos are going to be a dangerous team in the AFC West. And keep in mind, they, they need Peyton Manning to work out. They need Peyton Manning to stay healthy. Their backup quarterback is Kaleeb Haney right now. Okay, We saw what he can do when giving the keys to a car that was fully functioning and actually driving really good. We saw what he could do. He totaled that vehicle. That was the Chicago Bears last year. He totaled that vehicle, and it didn't work uh, at, at nearly the level that it was working at when, it, when that car was being driven by Jay Cutler. So you don't want this thing being turned over to Kaleeb Haney or Brock Osweiler. You don't want that. So if you're the Denver Broncos, you really need this thing to work out for you. So on to the hypothesis, and the hypothesis is, if Peyton Manning is, phys is right physically, the defense and the new additions perform adequately, and the team comes together as a whole, then the Denver Broncos can be a serious contender in 2012. Peyton Manning, if healthy, if right, and I keep saying that because you have to preference whatever you say about the Denver Broncos with if Peyton Manning is healthy, because if he's not, they're terrible. If he's good, if he's right, they're a formidable team. So if Peyton Manning is right physically, you're already a contender just by his presence on the field. So if they can get contributions from multiple sources on defense, special teams, and along that offense to help Peyton Manning, this is going to be a scary team in 2012. They're the wild card in the whole league because you don't know what you're getting out of Peyton Manning. You don't know what this Denver Broncos team is going to look like. And so you can't really say what they're going to do, but you know if Peyton's right, they're going to have a shot because it's Peyton Manning. And he's good for nine wins by himself. And so if they can get anything out of anybody else, They'll win 10, 11 games this season. And so you got to think, they're in the mix in the AFC West. They're in the mix in the AFC period because Peyton Manning is your quarterback. Materials needed. Peyton's new place. And look, whoever thought Peyton would wear or don another jersey in his NFL career? I didn't. I thought when he signed that long-term deal with the Colts, couple off seasons ago that was it he was locked up and he thought so too he said hey I wanted to finish my career here it's great that I was able to start and finish my career the same franchise no one foresaw the neck injury and the surgeries that would follow and his subsequent release from the Indianapolis Colts landing him in a Denver Broncos uniform but it's happened he's there and now it is now Peyton's new place and he needs to take over this franchise. And I, I feel like right now he's putting a lot of pressure on himself to live up to the standard and the height that he has garnered thus far in this offseason. And Peyton Manning is a perfectionist. And that's part of the reason why he's such a good quarterback. But he doesn't need to put more pressure on himself than he already has. He already puts a lot of pressure on himself to perform. He doesn't need to add any more pressure 
of trying to live up to the standards uh, of the, the guy that the Broncos brought in. And so he just needs to be Peyton Manning. That will be more than enough for the Denver Broncos. This is now his new home. Make it your new place, Peyton. Bronco busters. All right. The Denver Broncos need to be busters on defense. They need to be Bronco busters on defense. They need to be able to take teams and, and do uh, somewhat what they did in the 2011 season, and that's limit the amount of points that are scored. The reason why the Denver Broncos were able to go 8-8 eight eight last year is because the defense held teams down. And, and that's why I told you, don't be alarmed by the uh, stats of the 2011 season for the Denver Broncos. You can't really read too much into them because they gave up 40 points several times last year. They were drubbed in several games, and so it skewed the amount of points they gave up. This was a team that in many ball games gave up 10, 13, 16, 17 points and allowed the offense to do nothing all game and then Tim Tebow to have Tebow time in the fourth quarter with five minutes left and gave them a chance to win. This defense kept the Broncos in a plethora of games last year, and so they need to continue to do that, but be more consistent. You can't have games where you get beat 41 to 7 or 46 to 19. You got to be able to play consistent football. And a lot of that, again, had to do with Tim Tebow and the inability of the offense to move the ball and turning the ball over and putting the defense in bad situations. They can find a way to be consistent this year. The Denver Broncos will be a tough team to contend with in the AFC in 2012. Don't forget the running game. And I say that uh, kind of begrudgingly because Peyton Manning does like to run the football. I think it's a misconception that a lot of people feed into that he's a passing quarterback that doesn't like to run the football. He will audible to a run with no problem. He will check to a run if he sees that the, the defense that the uh, that the defense is in is something that's susceptible to a run, he'll check to a run and have no problem doing it. He's not an ego guy. He's not a stats guy. He just wants to win football games. And so the Denver Broncos can't forget about the running game. That was their strength last year. Willis McGahee came off one of his best seasons in his career. Feed him. You know, no Sean Marino's there. Give him the rock. You still got Lance Ball. You got Ronnie Hillman. Don't forget about the running game. Use these guys to your advantage. Allow Peyton Manning to go play action fake off of the running game. Don't forget about the running game. Are you gelling? This team is a totally different team than the one that was on the field for the Denver Broncos in the 2011 season. And so with Peyton Manning out there, Ronnie Hillman, a lot of these different receivers that they're bringing in, this team has to gel together quickly. And they don't have time to have guys coming in and taking two or three years to get on the same page. Mike Adams, uh, safety that they brought in from the, the Browns, they need him to come in and play stout football in that secondary. They don't have time for guys to come in and figure it out. They need to come in and figure it out on the fly and help this team win now. So this team has to ask themselves, are you jealous? Outfox the opponent. John Fox is a good head coach in the National Football League. He proved that last year when he took this ragtag Denver Broncos team and made them an 8-8 eight eight ball club. And so, John Fox has to find a way to outfox, outsmart the opponent. He has to continue to be a good head coach, know when to say when and when to allow Peyton Manning to have the leeway to do what he needs to do on the field. He has to make the right decisions on fourth down. Don't be coaxed into to Peyton Manning saying, hey, we can get this. If you feel like you need to punt the football, punt the football. Have a good pulse of your team. Make the correct decisions. Make this Denver Broncos team as good as it can be in the 2012 season. Data. Peyton Manning should throw for 4,050 passing yards, 30 to 33 touchdowns, 13 to 16 interceptions, and a 66.5% completion percentage. Demarius Thomas, 69 to 76 catches for 1,050 to 1,105 receiving yards, 6 to 8 touchdowns. Eric Decker, 67 to 74 grabs, 980 to 1,045 receiving yards, 
six to eight touchdowns. Their numbers are going to be elevated this year. I expect both of these guys to either go over or be near a thousand yards this year for the first time in their careers because Peyton Manning is going to elevate their level of play. They have to step up. They have no choice. Peyton Manning is going to demand it from them. He's going to make them better football players, and they need to step up, and I expect their numbers to, to inflate this year with the presence of Peyton Manning. Broncos tight ends. They have a plethora of tight ends. None really sticks out as a guy that you can count on consistently, but together this can be a, a solid tight end group. 70 to 77 catches, 720 to 800 uh, receiving yards, and 6 to 8 touchdowns. Broncos running backs. Look, Willis McGay, he had a heck of a year last year. But I don't think he's a workhorse anymore in this point of his career. And so I think it's going to be running back by committee, headed by Willis McGay. He's going to get the bulk of the carries, but he's going to have to share. And he's going to have to share with Ronnie Hillman. He's going to have to share with Noshaw Marino. He's going to have to share with Lance Ball. And so I have the Broncos together as a running back committee. So running backs. For the Broncos, 375 to 465 carries, 1,565 to 1,625 rushing yards, and 10 to 12 touchdowns as a group. Broncos D. All right, they have to force more turnovers. They only forced uh, 18 turnovers last year. It's not a lot of turnovers in the National Football League. They have to be better in this area. I expect them to be better. Anytime you're able to have Peyton Manning as your quarterback, they're going to score points. That's going to force teams to have to throw the football to keep pace. And now you get to tee off on opposing quarterbacks and force mistakes. And that's what they have to do in the 2012 season. So look for 22 to 26 turnovers, 39 to 44 sacks. This is a team that got after the quarterback last year. They got to the quarterback. They got sacks. They had 41 last year. So it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to up that number to right around 43 or 44. 20.5 points a game. They gave up up over 23 points last year. And that's not indicative of what this team is on defense. This team was better than that on the defensive side of the football. But again, when you give up 40 points two or three times during the course of the season, it's going to skew that number. They can keep this number under 21. They'll be in and have a chance to win a lot of games because Peyton Manning is good for three touchdowns a game. Seven to nine plays of 40 yards or more given up. The Broncos gave up their fair share of those plays last year. They were in the double digits in the amount of uh, plays over 40 yards. And they have to scale that number back. You know, every team in the league wants that number to be seven or less. And so the Broncos are no different. I have them for seven to nine plays of over 40 yards given up in, in the 2012 season. So we go on to the independent variable. And Peyton Manning is... The independent variable, because everything that the Denver Broncos are going to be in the 2012 season hinges upon Peyton Manning and his health and his ability to go out and get the job done for the Denver Broncos. If Peyton Manning is right physically and mentally up to the challenge, the Denver Broncos are going to be um, competing for the AFC West Championship and looking to make noise and possibly do some serious damage in the AFC playoffs. You move on to the dependent variable, and if Peyton Manning is on the field and he's getting the job done for the Denver Broncos, see, what you get in Peyton Manning is a quarterback who has an uncanny ability to construct scoring possessions, scoring drives. When Peyton Manning touches the football, you feel good that you're getting three or seven out of this possession. A lot of times, more often than not. And so his ability to put points on the board puts pressure on opposing offenses because now they feel like they have to keep pace. A punt for them means another opportunity for Peyton Manning to get on the field and get more points on the scoreboard. And what that does for the Denver Broncos defense is now it allows them to have more situations where they can pin their ears back and go after quarterbacks. If the Broncos jump on a team 17-0 and we're early in the second quarter, that team is now forced to abandon their game plan, which might have been let's run the game, run the ball, slow the game down, take Peyton Manning out of the game. If you're down 17-0, you're going 
That goes out the window now. Now you have to throw the football and put points on the board through the passing game, which allows the Denver Broncos to start teeing off on opposing quarterbacks, getting pressure, forcing errant throws, and now you're getting turnovers. Now you're getting to the quarterback, forcing fumbles and getting turnovers. This is going to help the Denver Broncos defense and help the Denver Broncos overall. Peyton Manning's presence helps the Denver Broncos be a better team in the 2012 season. And so you move on to the constant. And it's Champ Bailey for the Denver Broncos. Since coming in in the monumental trade that sent uh, Champ, Champ Bailey to Denver from Washington in exchange for Clinton Portis, in the second round uh, draft pick, Champ Bailey has come over to the Denver Broncos and solidified their corner position. For, for the last seven to nine years, Champ Bailey has been a force for the Denver Broncos and someone that they could count on in the secondary to make plays and just be a stabilizing force out there. You know, teams every now and again get a little frisky and feel like they can test Champ, and that's when he jumps up and bites you and makes you pay. Champ Bailey is a consummate professional. He makes plays. He's where he is, where he's, he's where he's supposed to be, when he's supposed to be there. He can get nosy at times because he his athleticism is one that allows him to, to peek in the backfield and, and use his makeup speed if he gets beat from being nosy. Being in his latter years now, he can't get away with that as much as he used to in his younger spry days. And so what he lacks now in his athleticism and speed, he's made up in veteran savvy and anticipation and, and prowess as a corner. And so Champ Bailey is definitely a constant for the Denver Broncos. And so you move on to the conclusion. And the Denver Broncos are now the wild card out west. Peyton Manning to the Denver Broncos changes things in the AFC landscape. If the Broncos are able to do the things necessary, keep Peyton Manning upright, and perform as a team in the 2012 season, they can be dangerous. And so the Broncos are a team that when healthy, when playing good football on the defense, defensive side of the football, they're a hard team to beat even when they had Tim Tebow. They were scary. Ask the Pittsburgh Steelers in the first round of the playoffs last year. When the Broncos are playing good football, they're a scary team. And so, hey, look, with Peyton Manning on your, on your side, you have a shot, always. And, and so, with that being said, I have, the, I have the Denver Broncos going 10-6. and six. That's good enough to win you an AFC West crown for the second consecutive year. Now, what you do with it once you get there remains to be seen. All you're looking for as a Denver Broncos fan is to have that ticket punched to the show, to get into the dance, get your ticket, have your seat ready and available, get there, and then once you're inside the facility, that is the playoffs, you make it happen once you get there. But everybody just wants a chance. I can't state that enough. Get in, and once you get there, you make it happen once you do so. And that's going to do it for the Denver Broncos and their lab report and experiment. On the other side of this break, I'll come back and we'll talk San Diego Super Chargers. See you in a bit. Lab, lab, quiz, lab, quiz, lab, quiz. Lab, 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 quiz, lab, quiz. Lab, lab, quiz. All right, I'm back, and I'm back with the San Diego Superchargers. <laughs> this, this team is one that never ceases to amaze me in the ways that they create to lose games. And it's from as much talent as they've had over the years, as many games as they've won, they've never been able to really put it together in one season. Because they're not a team that is equipped 
with the mechanism within to win. Winning is a state of mind and it is something that you can learn to do, but the great ones do it without having to learn. It's an innate trait. I don't think the San Diego Chargers possess that innate trait. They're a team that needed to learn how to win, and they did. But he wasn't able to get them over the top because winning is something that needs to be infectious. That everybody wants to do, and they want to do it no matter the cost. And sometimes in San Diego, you weren't sure if everybody was all in in terms of selling out and giving everything they had for the benefit of the team. And we don't, we, you don't know if that starts with North Turner or what, but speaking of North Turner and the strengths of the San Diego Chargers, you can say what you want about North Turner as a head coach. I'm not going to defend him. I can't defend him. I won't. I, I can't do it. But when talking about him as an offensive mind and a coordinator, watch your step, watch your mouth. North Turner is among the best in the National Football League at what he does. And what he does is construct offenses. He's been doing it for years, and he's one of the best at his craft. North Turner may not be the best head coach in the world, but he can scheme up offenses to help be potent and be effective in the National Football League. And so a strength of the San Diego Chargers is North Turner and his offense. North Turner has an uncanny ability to create a balanced attack on offense that takes advantage and full advantage of mismatches. He creates them and then exploits them, mismatches, on, the def on offense against opposing defenses. And so what he does is he sets plays up beautifully, uses the run game, then goes play action fake, creates route combinations that they've seen earlier in the game, and then plays off of these route combinations to create mismatches and holes in the defense that quarterbacks are able to exploit. Go back to his Cowboys days. Troy Aikman swears by North Turner. And for good reason. He was a big part of why the Cowboys were such a dominant force in the early 90s. You look at Phillip Rivers. He had to beg the San Diego Chargers brass not to fire North Turner. You know why he wanted to keep North Turner as his head coach? Because North Turner is a brilliant offensive mind. Ask Alex Smith. Before last year when he got with Jim Harbaugh, who was his best season under? As an offensive coordinator, was under North Turner. He knows how to get it done on the offensive side of the football. He knows how to coach them up. He knows how to scheme it up. And he knows how to get the best out of quarterbacks and his offense. And he is a strength for the San Diego Chargers as an offensive mind. You also look at the weaknesses of the Chargers. And, and look, the Chargers are a team that routinely is in the top in the NFL in offense. Four out of the last six years, they were in the top 10. 2010, they were a number one offense in the league. You know what else they were in 2010? The number one defense in the league. Yet, the Chargers still didn't make the playoffs. Want to know why? Their special teams was morbid in 2010. Horrendous, maybe one of the worst I've ever seen. Repeatedly having punts and field goals blocked and giving up returns or touchdowns in a return game, this team could not get out of the way of the rest of the team. Football is a game that is broken down into three aspects. Special teams, offense, and defense. Normally winning two out of three of those will yield you a victory. It did not happen in the 2010 season because the Chargers were so abysmal at special teams. It overshadowed their offense and their defense together combined. 
And so their special teams has been a problem for the last three or four years running. And so this is something that they have gotten better at since, but yet it's still not where they need it to be. You also look at the Chargers last year, and it was an anomaly for them, especially Phillip Rivers. They were extremely careless with the football. Phillip Rivers had arguably his worst season as a professional quarterback in the National Football League. He threw 20 interceptions last year. That's not Phillip Rivers-like football. He does not throw an inordinate amount of interceptions. But he did so in the 2011 season. Now, granted, he still had 27 touchdowns, but that's still not the ratio you're looking for when talking about Phillip Rivers, who is normally looked at and regarded as a top-tier quarterback in the National Football League. And so his interception numbers must come down. They had a, a minus in the turnover ratio of minus seven, the worst under North Turner's tenure for the San Diego Chargers. They have to be better at protecting the football and getting turnovers. They didn't get a lot of turnovers, but they turned the ball over so much that it overshadowed what turnovers they did get. And so they have to be better at protecting the football in the 2012 season. Camp battles. The San Diego Chargers don't have a lot of these to speak of. They're one of the biggest battles in camp, and this lets you know that there aren't a lot of battles to be had, is the backup center position. And the Chargers have a, a center, David Malk, that they drafted in the seventh round out of Michigan, who won the award for the best center in all of college football. He's coming in, and he's battling with second-year center Colin Baxter who's looking to back up Nick Hardwick, who's starting to get up there in age. And so you never know, especially with the Chargers and their injury history along their offensive line. You look at um, Dave Dillman, who, or excuse me, Chris Dillman, who just had to retire last year. And you also look at uh, McNeil, Marcus McNeil, who, who's, not, who's no longer on the team because of his uh, injury history. You never know when someone's going to cock out on this Chargers offensive line. And Nick Hardwick is probably the next candidate, being that he's the oldest and senior member of this offensive line. And so you got to think that the backup center is a position that they need to have ready to go just in case something happens to Nick Hardwick. And so these two are battling for the position. And you always, these two are both young guys. And so. You don't know who's going to get that nod, but in any event, whoever does, they have to be ready to step in at a moment's notice. Also, for the Chargers, uh, their special teams return team, they're looking for a returner. And you have several guys who, are, who double as receivers who are clinging and hanging on by a thread only because of their special teams ability and what they can bring to the special teams unit. Their value as a returner in the return game is the only thing saving them from getting cut. These guys are Roscoe Parrish, Richard Goodman, and Mike Willie. And all of these guys are on the chopping block to get cut. And if someone steps up, it can mean the end for one or two of these guys. And so looking at these first round of cuts, don't be surprised if one or two of these names on that list because, again, you only need one return man. And if they find out someone that they feel like they're comfortable with, and Goodman was that guy last year. He had a 105-yard kickoff return. And so he's that's his claim to fame right now. That's what he's using to, to hold up a roster spot for the San Diego Chargers because he's really not been in anything on the offensive side of the football as a receiver. And so – Really, if he can continue to show them that he can do that more often, he'll probably get that job. And guys like Mike Willie and Roscoe Parrish might be guys who find themselves looking for other employment in the National Football League. So we move on to the rookie watch. And uh, the Chargers had a quiet, human-like draft. Nothing special, you know, nothing eye-popping. Just looking to make have an impactful draft. And so their first pick 
was the defensive end out of South Carolina, Melvin Ingram. And when you talk hybrids and tweeners, you're normally talking about a guy on the offensive side of football. But if there was a defensive tweener hybrid type of guy, Melvin Ingram's pitcher would be next to the definition. He's a 6'1", undersized, defensive end, slash linebacker, who, and Chargers play a 3-4, so they're going to be looking for him to be able to be an outside linebacker probably. But he's a guy who's extremely quick, extremely agile, who can get to quarterbacks, get in the backfield, disrupt plays, disrupt timing of the offense, and make things happen for the defense. He's a playmaker, and the only thing you, you question is whether his lack of size and lack of length of arms are going to be a problem that teams take advantage of in the next level in the National Football League because a lot of times all tackles really want to do is get their hands on you. They feel like if they can get their hands on you and extend they can do what they want and, and redirect you in any direction that they would like. And, and, and Melvin Ingram doesn't have the ability to keep tackles away or off of him with his arms because they're so short. And so he has to get closer to defensive uh, offensive tackles, which is usually a cardinal sin because once they get their hands on you, these guys are big, powerful men who have the ability to stifle pass rushes and, and redirect guys around the quarterback and, and form a pocket. And so if Melvin Ingram can come in and find ways to create havoc and use his ability to his advantage, he could be a dangerous asset to the San Diego Chargers and instantly in the 2012 season. You look at defensive tackle Kendall Rays out of uh, Kentucky, I mean, excuse me, out of uh, Connecticut. He's a big man. He's a 6'5 defensive tackle who's really not going to wow you in anything that he does. Uh, he goes out, he's productive, he makes the plays again that are there to be made, but he's not going to make plays on his own. He's not someone that goes outside of the constraints of the defense and makes plays. He's going to do whatever the defense calls for him to do. If it calls for him to take on a double team, He'll take on a double team. He's not going to split that double team and make a play in the backfield or push that double team back into the running back three yards in the backfield and, and create havoc. No. What he's going to do is stand up to that double team and take on two blockers and, and hope to eat up space and help the linebackers be free to make a play. If it calls for him to run a stunt, he's going to run that stunt. Is he going to come around on that stunt and get after the quarterback? Probably not. But what he is going to do is run that stunt effectively and be where he's supposed to be when he's supposed to be there. He's a consistent player. You get a uh, consistent uh, motor out of this guy. He's going to do everything that you ask of him, but he's not going to make plays for you. Just a solid pick. Third round selection was the, the strong safety, Brandon Taylor out of LSU. Here's a guy, any, any defensive player you get out of LSU is usually going to be athletic, as is the case with Brandon Taylor. Brandon Taylor is an athletic, strong safety who loves to play in the box. His, his weakness, however, is that he doesn't play in man coverage and zone that often or that well. He didn't have to at LSU because of the amount of athleticism and talent that they had in the secondary. His his presence wasn't needed back there to help the corners. They had corners that could play on their own. And so he was in the box, causing havoc, making plays up around the line of scrimmage, which is what his strong suit is. He likes to stick his nose in a run game and help be disruptive in the box. And so the, the Chargers need to help or utilize him in that fashion and allow him to, to use his strengths to his advantage. If you want to look to put this guy in coverage, you're going to have to coach him up to do so. If you're thinking of plugging him in in his rookie season as a guy that can go out and play in space, you're sadly mistaken and you're going to pay for it. 
Putting him in the box is the best thing that the Chargers can do if they're going to play him in the 2012 season. He's going to come in and contribute on special teams immediately and look to see Brandon um, Taylor be someone that can help the Chargers moving forward. All right, fourth round selection, Ladarius Green out of Louisiana Lafayette. This is an interesting pick for the Chargers. He is or has been drafted as the heir pair to Antonio Gates. This is a 6'6", 245-pound tight end who runs a 4'5", 3'40", can move, can get in and out of breaks, and can catch the football. He has a lot of learning to do, and he's very raw as a prospect. But if they can groom this guy, let him learn, and they're not looking for him to play right now. They're looking to groom him, have him learn from Antonio Gates. He's not even third on the depth chart. They're just looking to stash this guy, let him learn, and develop him. And if he's anything near what they think he can be, he is going to be a force in the National Football League in two years. And so if this is the pick of all these picks in the draft. This is the one to keep an eye on because you won't hear a lot about him early on. But when he does hit, he can hit hard and hit the ground running and be a nuisance in the AFC West for years to come. Fifth round selection, Johnny Troutman, the offensive guard out of Penn State. This was a pick that the Chargers were excited about because they felt like they got a steal. Yeah. This is a three-year starter at Penn State, quality guy, come in and show up your offensive line immediately. But he got injured. He injured himself toward the latter part, um, or right before the draft, I should say. And so he's going to probably miss the entire 2012 season. They were hoping that he could come back, and they still are holding out hope that he might be able to come back in and, and just be put on the pup list. I don't know if they can hold a roster spot for him for that long. They have a lot of different areas that they need depth in, and just holding a roster spot for an unproven guy is tough to do. And so he might have to sit this season out. Who knows? But again, they feel like they got a steal. If they can nurse him back to health and get him to produce as he did at Penn State, they got a quality offensive lineman in Johnny Troutman. And their last selection in the draft, they had two seventh round selections. David Moak, the center out of Michigan that we talked about, that won the award for the best center in all of college football. He's someone that's going to come in and compete for that backup center position. And Edwin Baker, the running back out of Michigan State, he's a guy that, when getting carries, was effective. But I thought he lost a lot of his confidence when he was essentially demoted to backup running back and even pushed further down that uh, depth chart, uh, and he really didn't take it well, and he didn't respond the way you would like a, a football player to respond. Anytime adversity hits or you're asked to have a different role or capacity on the football team, you want that player to respond positively. And I thought he went into sort of a shell of himself after he was demoted, and those aren't things that you can have as a football player. And those are things that teams are going to stand for. So he's come in and show them that he's able to work. Because right now, as this running back um, backfield is constructed, there's not any carries for him. He's not going to make the team off of just being a running back. He's going to have to show them that he can play special teams and be a standout. Or, or else he probably won't make this football team. This takes us to our experiment. And I titled this one, Supercharged Bolts? Question mark. Are these San Diego Chargers ready to do something that is going to elevate this franchise? They seem like they've been running in place for the last three, maybe four years. You know, they start slow. They end hot. Nobody wants to play them. They get in the playoffs. They lose. Or they start slow, get hot, cool off, don't make the playoffs. Either way, it seems like the same old story for the San Diego Chargers. And at some point, changes will be made if they don't do something here shortly. And so you got to think, they got to do something 
and now is the time. If it's not done this year, we could see some substantial changes made to the San Diego Chargers in the upcoming season. So we go on to the research question. Is this the year that North Turner and Phillip Rivers finally put it together and make a serious playoff run? Or are the new additions and the veteran roster not enough to help North Turner keep his job? And that's basically what it boils down to for the San Diego Chargers this year. Win and get in or North Turner go home. And it's really simple. Phil Rivers essentially had to beg and plead to get North Turner to keep his job. And I thought that was a good move because if you were looking to win this year, the offense wasn't the problem. Overall, as a team, the Chargers needed to shore up some things. And I guess you put that on the head coach because it's his job to have the team as a whole ready to play on Sundays. But the offense wasn't the problem. They had problems on special teams. The defense wasn't what it needed to be, and they needed pieces. And so uh, given those pieces this year, they made some acquisitions. They went out and got Jared Johnson. You know, they went out and made some moves in the offseason. Corey Legia is starting to look like a player. You know, they go and get Melvin Ingram. These are all players that are looking to contribute this year. And so you're hoping that the defense is that much better because of the additions that they've made. And so you look at this team as a whole. They need to step up this year and get it done or North Turner won't be there to have the blame fall on him in the 2013 season. He will be gone. Hypothesis. If Phillip Rivers is back to his normal self, the new receivers step up, Ryan Matthews can stay healthy and produce, the defense and special teams be significant contributors, then the San Diego Chargers can challenge for an AFC West title and make it back to the playoffs. And Phillip Rivers can't turn the ball over 20 times. I don't expect him to do that again. These receivers that they have coming in, your Eddie Royals, your Robert Meachams, they have to come in and help immediately. They don't have a grace period where they can come in and, and assimilate themselves gradually. They have to step in and have that production that Vincent Jackson was bringing to the table, and then some. You know, these, this is two guys coming in to replace one. So they need to exceed what Vincent Jackson was able to do. If Vincent Jackson was able to put up 1,150 yards receiving last year with seven touchdowns, they need to be able to come in and together, uh, between Eddie Royal and Robert Meacham, they need to be able to come in and supplement that with about 13 or 14, maybe 1,500 yards of, of receiving yards and about nine to ten touchdowns together, minimum. They need to be able to come in and help Phillip Rivers. He needs targets to go to, other than Mike, uh, Malcolm Floyd and Antonio Gates. He has to have someone to throw the ball to. And their young, promising uh, receiver, Vincent Brown, went down with a, a ankle injury. He broke his ankle, and so he's going to be out for a while. And that's a big blow to this receiver corps because he looked good as a receiver. He looked like a young, hungry receiver that was able to make plays for these Chargers offense. And so they're going to miss him for about four to six weeks of the regular season. And so they got to have these young, these new guys, Meacham and Royal, come in and pay immediate dividends for this offense. Materials needed. Phillip being Phillip. Phillip Rivers has to be Phillip Rivers. He can't turn the ball over 20 times. He has to be more consistent. He has to lead this football team on the field. And what he really needs to do is not put more pressure on himself to make plays than is already there. He's already the leader of this team. He's already the focal point of this offense and this team as a whole. And so he did, he need not put more pressure on himself than is already there. Now, I thought he tried to shoulder the burden of having the San Diego Chargers win football games last year. I felt like he was pressing, and he pressed and he pressed and he pressed until it started to show in his game. Forcing that that uh, Kansas City Chiefs game last year it was indicative of how bad uh, Philip Rivers was pressing. A simple center quarterback exchange that cost them a football game that they could have easily and probably would have easily won had he not fumbled the football. But again, Philip Rivers pressing the issue 
and, and it cost them a football game. He doesn't need to do that this year. Just be Phillip. You'll be fine if you're just the Phillip Rivers of old. All right, Matthews, you're up. Okay, there's nobody else around to, to help you anymore. There's no LT. There's no uh, Tolbert. This is you. There's no Mike Tolbert. There's no LT. There's no one else that is just your show now. You have to stay healthy. You have to be the back that they drafted and step up and make plays for this offense. You need to explode this year. And even if you don't play in the first game because of that, that collarbone injury, come in like a world beater and, and hit the ground running. Make plays for this offense. You're up. It's your time, and you have to step up. Defense and special teams matter. You need to make a difference. Last year, this defense was indifferent. There were one of these defenses where you went, eh, eh, eh. You know, they really didn't make a difference on the impact in the game. They, they were steady at times. And they didn't really make a lot of plays. They didn't wow you. They didn't do anything of note. They were just there going through the motions. You have to make a difference. You have to matter if you're the San Diego Chargers defense this year. Special teams, same thing. You have to make a difference. You have to do things in the return game. Stop teams from returning kickoffs and, and punts on you. Do things to be solid. Put teams at the four-yard line and make them go 96 yards to score a touchdown. Down punts inside the 10-yard line. Be special on special teams. Last year, the defense and the special teams didn't matter. They didn't do anything of note. They have to matter this year. They have to make a difference in order for the Chargers to get back to the postseason in 2012. Last stand, North. This is it. If North doesn't get it done this year, he won't have a job as a head coach. He'll get a coordinator job. He's too good to not be an offensive coordinator in this league. But he won't get another head coaching job. This has to be it, you would think. I said that two times ago. When he was a head coach. I said that the last time he was a head coach. When he was with the Raiders. That was his last time. North Turner's ability to be a great offensive coordinator. Coaxes head coaches into believing that he can do it as a head coach. That's why he's had so many jobs in the league. Because his ability to coach up offenses is second to none in the league. And it, it gives coaches and GMs and and brass, false optimism that he's a great head coach. That he is not. What he is, though, is a heck of an offensive schemer. And this is it for him. If he can't get not only the offense, but the defense and special teams and this team as a whole to play good football, he won't have a job as a head coach in 2013. New additions. What do you bring to the table? If you're a San Diego Chargers fan, if you're the coaching staff, you're the brass, that's what you want to know. New additions, what do you bring to the table? Jared Johnson, Atari Bigby, Robert Meacham, Eddie Royal, what do you bring to the table? Are you ready to come in and contribute as San Diego Chargers? Because you can't live off of what you've done for other organizations especially Atari Bigby, who has really done nothing in the last two seasons after having a, a good start to his career in Green Bay. You can't live off of what you've done for the Broncos if you're Eddie Roy. You can't live off what you've done for the Saints if you're Robert Meacham. Jared Johnson, I think he's going to be a great addition to this Chargers defense coming over from the Ravens. But they need these guys to step up and produce as San Diego Chargers. And so... They have to be able to help contribute to take that pressure that I spoke of off of Phillip Rivers. Make him feel comfortable back there that he doesn't have to do everything himself. Make his job easier. So these guys must show up and contribute something to the San Diego Chargers in the 2012 season and moving forward. So that takes us to data. Phillip Rivers. 4,490 passing yards, 26 to 30 touchdowns, 
11 to 15 INTs and 64.2% completion percentage. That number of interceptions must come down. I expect it to come down. That's not Phillip Rivers. That's not who we've come to know and love as a quarterback in the National Football League. He'll get it together. He'll be a better quarterback in 2012. Robert Meacham, he has to step up. He went, he's going to have to go from catching 39 to 43 balls in New Orleans and being uh, a piece, a fixture in that offense to being a centerpiece of this receiving corps out in San Diego. And that's what they're paying him to do to be a number one receiver. 60 to 69 grabs, 830 to 890 receiving yards, six to eight touchdowns. He's going to have to elevate his game. Malcolm Floyd. And this is an interesting guy right here because you don't really think of Malcolm Floyd as, as that big of a playmaker unless you're out west in the AFC West. You don't really know of Malcolm Floyd and what he brings to the table. This is a 6'5", long, rangy receiver who goes up and makes plays routinely for Phillip Rivers down the football field. And so he makes big plays consistently and routinely. And so over his course of his seven-year career, He's never averaged less than 14 yards a catch. And so that says a lot. And he's a guy that goes, and in three of those seasons, he's been up over six, 17 yards a catch. I mean, he's making big plays. In two of those years, he was close to 20 yards per catch. He doesn't get a lot of catches, but the ones that he gets, he makes counts, and he racks up yards because of it. If he can ever put together a 60-catch season, I'm, you're looking at probably a 10, 11, I mean, 1,100 yards. And so if he can step up this year and stay healthy, that's one of his biggest issues. He's a frail body uh, kind of guy. His, his uh, frame is very slender, and so he doesn't hold up uh, to the beating that that is put upon him in the NFL season, and so he usually misses games. But look. They can get something out of Malcolm Floyd this year. Watch out. I have him down for 44 to 50 catches, 810 to 870 yards, six to eight uh, four to six touchdowns. Watch out for Malcolm Floyd. He's a dangerous receiver down the field. Antonio Gates, 67 to 74 catches, 800 to 865 yards, receiving seven to nine touchdowns. They say that he's healthier than he's been in the past two, three seasons. If that is the case, Antonio Gates will be a viable option for Phillip Rivers, as he always is, but even more so than he has been in the last couple of years. That Liz Frank injury on his foot has been an inhibitor, and he's really struggled and labored through it. If he's healthy, Antonio Gates will be dangerous and another weapon that Phillip Rivers can rely on, as he has done so throughout the course of his career. Ryan Matthews has to step up this year. He did a good job last year. They need him to be even better in 2012. 250 to 275 carries, but 1,125 to 1,165 yards rushing, five to eight touchdowns. He's got to be good this year. He's got to be better than good. He's got to be great. Bolt's defense. Force 24 to 27 uh, turnovers. Get 36 to 39 sacks. Hold teams under 21 points, 20.3 points per game, and 79 plays of 40 yards given up. The independent variable for the Chargers in the 2012 season is the defense and all the new additions that they've made to this defense. You look at Jared Johnson, you look at Melvin Ingram, you look at Atari Bigby, you look at all these guys that they've added to this defense. This defense has to step up in the 2012 season. The offense was ranked sixth last year. They got it done. They were good enough offense to take this team to the playoffs, but the defense was not on the same page. They were ranked 20th defense overall last year. They got to be better. They can't be middle of the pack, bottom half of the league in defense, which they were last year. They have to be a good defense. They have to force turnovers. They have to get the ball back to this offense and let them do what they do best. And that's score points, put points on the board. And so this defense needs to be better in the 2012 season, create havoc, get the ball to the offense, and allow them opportunities to do what they do. And that's helped the San Diego Chargers 
and be a formidable team in the AFC West. So you get to the dependent variable. If this defense is able to step up along with this special teams unit that has suffered you know, over the last two or three seasons, they're able to do the things that, are, that is necessary to help the San Diego Chargers team win ball games. And the San Diego Chargers will be the team that no one wants to play which they are annually around December and into January. They will be the team that no one wants to play and also be a team that actually gets into the postseason. But the defense has to play. They have to get turnovers, get teams off the field, get the ball back to their offense. The special teams needs to augment what the offense and defenses are doing and not take away from what they're doing. They need to be a help, not a hindrance. So now we get, get to the constant, and the constant for the San Diego Chargers is Phillip Rivers and Antonio Gates. These two have been uh, the linchpin of this San Diego Chargers franchise and have been helping them win games as a winning combination since 2006. Gates actually dates back to 2003, but uh, Philip Rivers didn't really start getting, uh, you know, consistent playing time since 2006, and so these two together have been the backbone and the centerpiece of the San Diego Chargers offense. It's been a top 10 offense essentially four out of the last six years, and so the Chargers will only go as far as Philip Rivers can take them in terms of being consistent. And the one thing you have to love if you're a San Diego Chargers fan is that every week you know that 17 is going to be under center. He does not miss football games. He hasn't missed football games since being a full-time starter in 2006. And so Phillip Rivers is someone that you can count on to be under center, to take all the snaps, and to be the unquestioned leader of this football team along with Antonio Gates. He's been a consistent force for the Chargers, someone that has helped them reach the heights that they've reached, but they need to take it a step further. And wherever they're going to go, these two guys are going to lead them, being the leaders of this team. And uh, if you're the San Diego Chargers, you know that these have been your constants, and they will continue to be your constants until they can no longer play uh, the game of football at the level that you expect from them. But these are the constants of the San Diego Chargers, Phillip Rivers, Antonio Gates. You move on to the conclusion. And look, these Chargers, uh, when offensively potent and efficiently potent on offense, that's the key with them is not turning the football over and doing it in an efficient manner because they're potent. They're a potent offense but doing it in an efficient manner that allows them to score you know, more times than not and not turn the football over. That is the issue that reared its ugly head last year with all the turnovers. And so if you're the Chargers, it's really important to protect the football this year and get it done. All right, so the Chargers, uh, this is it. This is the last stand for the Chargers as we know the, the Chargers, as they are constructed right now. You look at this next season coming up in 2012, and if they don't get it done, some major changes could be coming to that front office. And I'm not just talking North Turner. I'm talking A.J. Smith, the GM as well. He could be out because I feel like he's tied at the hip, so to speak, to North Turner. He had opportunities to get rid of North Turner as a head coach, and he's decided to stick it out with him. And so if this doesn't work, he might have to fall on the sword as well. And he might be out as uh, Chargers GM. And if that's the case, this would be a totally different football team. And once you get a new GM, you know GMs like to come in and put their imprint and uh, put their thumbprint on teams. And so guys that have been on this roster, you know, might be out the door. And might not be seen as guys that need to be on the roster anymore. So this is a big season for the Chargers. If they're looking to keep this team together, they got to win. If they want their coach to be back, they have to win and win big this year. And so uh, it's going to be tough 
because the Chargers aren't a consistent football team. That's what's really plagued them over the last five years or so is their inconsistency. One minute, they look like one of the worst teams in the league. The next minute, you know, they're one of the hottest teams in football, playing some of the best football in the, in the National Football League. And, and really, you're asking, does anybody want to play the Chargers? But in any given game, you don't know which Charger team is going to show up. And that's been their problem. That's been their Achilles heel is the fact that you don't know which Chargers team is going to show up on Sundays. And so with that being said, I have the Chargers going 9-7 and seven and just barely missing the playoffs. Winning this division in the past 9-7 and seven would probably land you a division title. But with Peyton Manning coming into that division, I don't think nine wins is going to be enough to win that division. I think you're going to have to get to 10 wins to be in the discussion to win that division. And that's debatable. We don't know what Peyton Man is going to do. And 9-7 and seven could uh, be enough to win that division. But I, I don't see it. I see Peyton Manning and the Broncos being a team that can get to 10 victories. And so 9-7 and seven from the Chargers won't get it done in the 2012 season, which will probably prompt a lot of changes in the offseason for the San Diego Chargers. And that's going to do it for the Chargers in their lab reporting experiment. So that's a touchdown. Go ahead and throw it up. And real quick, I want to tack on an extra point. And uh, over this weekend, be on the lookout for roster moves. Teams have to cut down their rosters to 75. Be on the lookout for the rest of these preseason games. Uh, I know I'm excited personally to see Robert Griffin III and the Redskins take on the Colts' first home game for the Redskins in this offseason and in the 2012 season. And so it's going to be a lot of fun to sit down and watch and see some of the changes that have been made and see them uh, take shape and form and start to see how this roster is going to round out. See so guys step up and you need to be looking out and a lot of these teams and seeing if players like Russell Wilson, you know, a lot of these other teams, the Jets haven't scored an offensive touchdown in the preseason yet. The Cowboys haven't given up a defensive touchdown uh, on their with their first team on the field. And so, you know, you look at these teams and see what they're going to do. Uh, watch these games. Watch them closely. See who's performing, who's not, who's on the field, who's not. Draw your inferences and, and get ready for the start of the 2012 season because it is vastly approaching and it is quickly going to be upon us. And I can't wait. And this is a big step towards the regular season, the third week of the preseason ends. And so look out for all of these things and more over the course of this weekend. And with that, it's going to be an episode. I thank you for joining me again. Hit me up in the inbox, in the lab room at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at in the lab room. That's the Twitter handle. I'm on Facebook. Like me on Facebook at in the lab room. I thank you for joining me again. And I'll see you on Monday. There will be plenty to talk about, and we will have great discussion. And look, Monday will be the last of the tour days, the last lab reports and experiments done. And so celebrate, as my uh, old high school coach used to say, celebrate. And so I'm excited. You should be excited. The football season is, is going to be upon us soon. I can't wait. I'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Enjoy all the festivities. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Same time, same place. I'm out.